Hey guys, today we're going to wrap up gases and begin talking about intermolecular forces. Okay, first thing you need to know about is a uh, mole fraction, and it is exactly what it sounds like. Um, so let's say you have a container and you have two different gases in it. Now let's say that the blue gas is helium and the purple gas is nitrogen. So we know that from the ideal gas law, the identity of the gas doesn't matter. Just the number of molecules will affect the pressure. What's useful about this relationship is that if you know the fraction of molecules that are helium versus anything else, then you can also find the fraction of the pressure that comes just from the helium particles. Okay, so let's say, for example, in this container, we have um, one third of the moles are helium, which means that two thirds of them are nitrogen. Okay, literally a mole fraction. Um, if my total pressure is 12 atm, inside that flask total pressure to find the pressure of just the helium gas i can basically take one third of that pressure which would be 4 atm because the moles are directly proportional to pressure i would also know that the pressure of just the nitrogen gas would be uh, 8 atm because that's two thirds or the remaining pressure Okay, so you can use the mole fraction, literally a fraction of the moles, the total moles in the container, um, and you can essentially multiply by that fraction, multiply the total pressure by that fraction to get the um, individual pressure of the individual gases or the partial pressure of those individual gases. Okay, I'd like to take a look at the difference between speed and kinetic energy. Um, we know from kinetic molecular theory that temperature is directly proportional to the average kinetic energy. So that means if you have two containers, two different gases, two different pressures, whatever, as long as they're at the same temperature, the containers will have the same average kinetic energy. That doesn't necessarily mean that the molecules are moving at the same speed. For example, if you have a container with helium gas in it and a container with nitrogen gas in it, and if they're at the same temperature, they have the same average kinetic energy, same energy of motion. Well, the helium has to be moving faster than the nitrogen. And that's because it has a smaller molar mass. It has a mass of four, while nitrogen only has a mass of, or my, nitrogen has a mass of 28. It's a lot bigger. Um, since it's bigger, uh, it's going to carry more momentum with it. It's going to have more energy to it. Well, even though it's moving slower. Helium has lower molar mass, so it will have less momentum, and it will require a higher speed to obtain the same kinetic energy. So the takeaway from this is that the smaller the molar mass, the greater the speed. And this is, of course, when you're comparing two gases at the same temperature. Now, we measure this using something called ERMS, or rather um, root mean square speed. Um, all you really need to know, again, is that helium, uh, the, the smaller gas, whatever it happens to be, will be moving faster. It will have a larger root mean square speed because it has a lower molar mass and it will need to move faster to have the same kinetic energy. Okay, starting in on chapter 11, um, there are states of matter. And the biggest difference between the states of matter is the distance between the particles. And there are lots of states of matter. Um, there's 10 or 12, something like that, but we only really need to focus on three of them, obviously solids, <laughs> liquids, and gases. And the biggest difference is the distance between the particles. Solids are going to be the most tightly packed, usually. Um, liquids will be a little bit further apart and able to move about, and gases, of course, will have the most distance between them because and gases are the most easily compressible. Now, we refer to solids and liquids as condensed phases, um, which basically just means that they do not spread out to fill their whole container. 
Now, the state of matter that a substance is in um, depends on two different things, the kinetic energy and the strength of attractions between the particles. Um, so the faster they're moving, the more easy that they can break those attractions between the particles. Now, the attractions between molecules, we call them intermolecular forces. It's the force between two molecules. This is different from intramolecular forces. Intramolecular versus intermolecular. This is between molecules and this is within molecules. So intramolecular would be covalent bonds and ionic bonds and metallic bonds. We're going to focus on intermolecular forces. They're attractions between molecules and they tend to be weaker than intramolecular. Okay. Now these intermolecular forces are weak, but they're important enough and strong enough to control physical pro properties like boiling and melting point, um, vapor pressure, and viscosity. And that's because it has to do with energy. If this attraction is stronger, it's going to take more energy to break that bond, and you're going to wind up with a higher boiling or melting point. You're also going to wind up with a lower vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is how much of a gas will evaporate at any given temperature. But if you have stronger intermolecular forces, it's harder for the gas to evaporate, so you'll have a lower vapor pressure. And then viscosity, if you have a stronger intermolecular attraction, um, they're going to be able to flow less because they're sticky. They're sticking to each other. So you'll have a higher viscosity. Now, these intermolecular forces, uh, all together we call them van der Waals forces. Um, you hopefully remember the van der Waals equation from the gas laws, which is uh, correcting for the ideal gas law, uh, discrepancies in the ideal gas law. Um, and it's because of some of these attractions between the molecules. Now, there's three main van der Waals forces. We're also going to talk about a uh, fourth intermolecular force called ion dipole. Um, they don't really consider it a van der Waals force because it's like sort of halfway between ionic and dipole. We'll take a, a little bit closer look at it. So the first kind are called London dispersion forces. Um, sometimes you'll see it just as London or just as dispersion forces, uh, but I usually call it London dispersion. Now, the electrons in an atom are moving randomly throughout its orbital. Okay, so in this case, you have um, two helium atoms, and helium has two electrons in it when it's neutral, which it always is neutral. Um, so it has two electrons. Now, since they're moving randomly, occasionally they could wind up on the same side of that atom. Okay, it doesn't happen that often, but it could uh, because they're moving randomly. In that case, you wind up with a slightly negative charge on one side of the atom because electrons are negative. And then you're left over with a slightly positive side on the other. Okay, so when the electrons randomly go to one side, that side becomes negative, um, and the atom overall becomes polar. Okay, it has a slight dipole moment. Okay. Now, once one atom is polarized by random electron motion, it can actually help to cause other atoms in the sample to also become polarized. Um, and it's because you, if you have a slightly positive on one side of one, one atom, it can attract electrons from another atom sort of over to it. Now this is very weak, and that's why we use this symbol, this one, partial negative. Um, that means very, very weak or slightly negative um, or you know, slightly positive. Okay. Um, so what this is called, this is a random dipole moment the first one that becomes polarized, and then um, any other ones that it affects around it, that's called an induced dipole, because it, the, the other thing is causing it to happen. 
Okay, so London dispersion forces are the actual slight attractions between positive ends and negative ends of atoms that have um, these random dipole with or instantaneous dipole um, versus induced dipole. Um, so slight attractions between the positive and negative due to random electron motion and induced dipoles. Now these forces are present in all molecules, all of them. So if a question asks you what type of intermolecular forces are present, London dispersion forces should always be one of your answers because it's always there. Okay. Um, it's just some are more likely to uh, form like more London dispersion forces or stronger London dispersion, London dispersion forces than other molecules. And we call the tendency for the electron cloud to distort in this way, we call it polarizability, which again is one of my favorite words, polarizability. So the more likely it is for electrons to hang out on one side of an atom or one side of a molecule, that atom is more polarizable. Now, the shape of a molecule affects its polarizability. The more surface area that there is, so like if you have a long skinny molecule, they tend to have stronger dispersion forces because they're more polarizable. The electrons are more likely to um, kind of congregate on one side of the molecule. If you have less surface area, like this one, um, like short fat ones, there's less surface area, it's less likely for the electrons to gravitate to one side because there's more of this inner space for the electrons to travel in. Okay, so um, more surface area equals stronger dispersion forces. Okay, now the strength of dispersion forces also increases with increase in increased weight. So they're more polarizable when they have a larger molar mass. Um, and that's because they have more electrons. More electrons are easier to polarize them because they're more likely to randomly wind up slightly more on one side than the other. Now, the second type of intermolecular force is called a dipole-dipole interaction. And this is between molecules that have permanent dipoles, so polar molecules. Okay. If you have a question asking about what intermolecular forces are present, you should always check to see if a molecule is symmetrical. If it's something like methane, which is perfectly symmetrical. Methane does not have dipole-dipole interactions. It only has London dispersion forces. But if you have something that is polar, it is asymmetrical. Water doesn't have that many electrons. There we go, water. If you have something that is permanently asymmetrical, permanently polar, it will have dipole-dipole interactions. And basically the negative end of one molecule will be attracted to a positive end of another one. Um, and these forces become really important when the molecules are close to each other. So if you have um, like a gas at a high temperature, it's less likely that dipole-dipole interactions are going to be a thing. Now make sure you know how to draw these. So um, anything that has lone pairs like water, um, that's going to have the negative side. The opposite side of the molecule will be the positive side. If you're drawing a dipole-dipole interaction, don't put a negative next to a negative. That won't work. The negative side is attracted to a positive side. So you draw dot, 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 dot towards the positive side of another molecule, like that. That would be a dipole-dipole interaction. Now, the more polar, the higher the boiling point. Um, so the more asymmetrical it is, the stronger those dipole-dipole interactions will be, the harder it will be to break apart those intermolecular um, attractions, those intermolecular forces. Harder to break apart forces, it will take a higher temperature to make it evaporate, so boil it. So which things have a greater effect on the actual physical properties, the dipole-dipole interactions or the dispersion forces? Now, if the two molecules are a similar size and a similar shape, the dipole-dipole interactions will likely be the dominating force. So, in general, dipole-dipole is stronger because it's a permanent dipole and a permanent dipole interacting versus just random and induced dipoles. Um, but if you have 
one molecule that is significantly larger than the other, the um, dispersion forces in that really large one can be stronger than the dipole-dipole interactions in a smaller molecule. Usually they'll um, they'll give you an example like they'll say um, C six H eighteen H fourteen excuse me versus um, CH two O for example. Okay, this is a polar molecule. It looks like this. It's formaldehyde. Um, this is a nonpolar molecule. I'm not going to draw on the hydrogens, but this one is a lot bigger. So the question might be worded like um, the boiling point of hexane is higher than the boiling point of formaldehyde. Explain why. So you'd have to say, well, even though formaldehyde has dipole dipole interactions, which are usually stronger because hexane is so much bigger, it has stronger London dispersion forces because it is more polarizable. There's that favorite word. Okay, the third kind of intermolecular force is just called a hydrogen bond. And hydrogen bonds are basically super strong dipole-dipole interactions. And it only happens when a hydrogen on one molecule has a dipole-dipole interaction with either oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen on a different molecule. Okay. And it doesn't have to be two of the same. Like this is ammonia and this is ammonia. You could have two different polar substances interacting, like water and ammonia. Okay, as long as the hydrogen on one is interacting with an oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. So the way you remember that is we say that hydrogen bonding is fawn. Fa not fawn. Hydrogen bonding is fawn. Like fun, but fawn. Yay. Now, the reason why these three atoms are important is because um, they have the three highest electronegativities. So, for example, in um, the oxygen-hydrogen bond, like in water, the oxygen is so electronegative that it is pulling the electrons from the hydrogen. And it pulls it so much that the electrons in hydrogen pretty much always stay around the oxygen. Um, so you wind up with a really strong permanent dipole um, with anything with um, oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Um, so again, it pulls the electrons away from the hydrogen almost always, and that exposes the hydrogen nucleus, which is just a single proton. Um, so you have a single positive charge just kind of hanging out there, which again makes it very easy and very strongly bound to a negative end an oxygen, a nitrogen, or a fluorine. So super strong dipole-dipole interactions. Now ion-dipole interactions occur only when you have an ion in solution reacting with a polar molecule. Now the most common is of course some kind of salt that is dissolving in water. Um, <coughs> so again, solutions of ions. Now, the strength of these forces is what makes it possible for the actual ions to break apart and form these interactions with the polar molecule. Um, it's also why some, why most salts will dissolve in water or dissociate in water is the more accurate term. Now, this picture is very important because they could ask you to draw something like this in the AP exam. If you have a negative chlorine atom, the positive ends of the solvent which is almost always water, the positive side, the hydrogen side, will orient itself toward the negative chlorine atom. With sodium, on the other hand, it's positively charged, so the negative side of the water molecule, the oxygen side, will orient itself toward the positive sodium atom. You can't have a negative and a negative interacting or a positive and a positive interacting. It's got to be one of each, so be careful with that. Okay, so this is a really good chart for determining um, what types of intermolecular forces are in a particular substance. So if there's ions, um, if there's ions present, if there's po also polar molecules present, then you'll have ion-dipole forces. 
if there's no polar molecules, then you just have ionic bonding, like um, normal ionic compounds with metal and a non-metal. If you don't have any ions, you want to check to see if the molecule is polar. If it's not polar, then you only have dispersion forces, London dispersion forces. If it is polar, you've got to check to see, is hydrogen bonding fun? If it is, then you've got hydrogen bonds present. Um, if not, then it's just dipole-dipole interactions. And of course, this shows you an increasing interaction strength as a general rule, although we talked about um, how dipole-dipole can occasionally be weaker than dispersion. If the molecule is bigger, it will have um, is significantly bigger. It can have stronger dispersion forces than dipole-dipole. So how do these affect their physical properties? Basically, the stronger the attraction, um, the more energy it's going to take to break apart those attractions. And that has a lot of um, effects. One of those effects is viscosity. And we define viscosity as the resistance of a liquid to flow. So basically, the more molecular, um, intermolecular forces, or the stronger the intermolecular forces, the more it will resist flow, because it's stickier. Fewer intermolecular forces will lead to a greater flow, an easier flow. Okay. Um, so viscosity increases with stronger intermolecular forces and decreases with higher temperature. So if you ever really need to pour a lot of molasses, you could just heat it up. Another one is surface tension. Um, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the surface tension of that liquid. Um, so it's the net inward force by the molecules on the surface of a liquid. So stronger intermolecular forces, like hydrogen bonding in water, will cause it to have a high surface tension. That's how you see the, the bug walking on the water here. It's because the water is forming those hydrogen bonds, and the weight of the bug is not enough to break those hydrogen bonds.